Well, it's that time of the year, starting back with the school year and everything is going forward with that. It makes me have back, think back to some of the nightmare days of college for me. You know, when you have those, those tests and those exams and those makeup exams, you know, because in high school it was really easy. I do, usually do pretty well on my exams, but in college, the professors were always crushing you, so the grades would be low, and then sometimes you could have a makeup exam. Made me think of this one economics class that I had. There were two tests. It was a midterm and a final. And uh, so it was a tough class, and so I was studying for the midterm, and the week of the midterms, I decided, you know, I need a break. So I'm just going to go out and drive in the mountains. Uh, my class was on a Tuesday, uh, a, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so it was a Tuesday. So I said I would go in to have a, enjoy a nice ride in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Had this nice ride, and then I get back and I find and I have a friend of mine said, "Hey, how did you do on the exam?" And I was like, "What exam?" They go, "The exam that we had today." I said, "But it's Tuesday." They go, "Didn't you read the syllabus? It said that the exam was going to be." Uh, excuse me, it was gonna, not going to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but a special day here. And so I go and try to talk to the professor. Again, no, there's no makeup test. And so I end up failing the class. And so for those of you who don't know, I was not a stellar college student. I barely, <laughs> barely graduated college, did much better in seminary, but I was not a, a model student in college. You know, those makeup tests, can be, they can save you. They can make you or break you. And we all need those types of makeup tests. I don't know about you, uh, but I need makeup, makeup tests. We all go through these things in life where we need a second chance. We need a makeup test. We see how we did things, and we would like to do it over again. And then sometimes we'd like to do it over again and again and again. You know, it's interesting, but God is a God of makeup tests. And we read a little bit about that in the passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles or a device, you can follow along as we read... In Mark chapter 6, verses uh, 45 through 56. I'm reading, and verse 45 said, Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them. Yeah, it was terrifying. It was really terrifying. Made you made you cry, scream and cry. It's okay. Thank. I mean, I I really appreciate when there's cooperation and coordination for sound effects. It's awesome. But now you're experiencing. So this makes it epic. It's experiential. So you know the terror that they were fearing as they were in the boat. But when they saw him walking on the water, they they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, "Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid." And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Verse 53, And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they had gotten out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And whenever he came to villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that he might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Let us pray. Lord, as we open up your word today, it might just seem like a cool story about some weird stuff that happened a long time ago, but Lord, we know that you want to speak to us through the truth of your word into our situation today. Lord, if you put this in the Bible, it is relevant for our situation. As we open up the scripture and as we look at what you teach us, we pray, Father, that you would transform us from the lessons here, that we might live differently because of our encounter with you through your spirit in your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the main idea that I want you to take away today from this uh, lesson about the makeup test is when lessons go unlearned, God gives us other opportunities. 
When lessons go unlearned, God gives us other opportunities, and sometimes those opportunities can be pleasant opportunities and sometimes more challenging opportunities. But the thing is, we need to be learning the lessons. Now, the message today is going to be a little bit... Uh, heavy on the front end and a little bit light on the back end. So I'm going to spend most of the time addressing the first two points and then the third point I'll address very briefly. So don't, don't get freaked out when I don't hit everything at the same time. But this main idea is with the lessons that go unlearned, the Lord loves us enough to help us to grow through those lessons by sometimes repeating similar lessons. And, and there's, a, there's a process that we learn through that. As we examine this passage today and break it down into sections, we will discover three principles on the pathway to spiritual maturity. Because we're all in progress, we're all in process, and we're all in different levels on our own journey. But the first thing that I want you to understand today is that growth occurs through flying solo. Growth occurs through flying solo, and we see about that, and we read about that in verses 45 through 47 where it says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up into the mountain to pray. And the evening came, the boat was out at sea, and he was alone on the land. So this, the th whole idea about flying solo means that you're operating without the security net of a physical presence. Now, I'm not a pilot. I uh, never have been. But I know that pilots, they don't just take a newbie and say, hey, go up in a plane. They let their instructor log many hours with them, providing a variety of scenarios. But the goal is not so that you always have your instructor with you all the time. That he equips you so that one day you will have to fly solo. And it's often it's during the solo flights that you are really gaining confidence because you have trained, you understand. And when a crisis arises, you have to deal with that crisis. And so flying solo is a part of the growth process. Now we see that Jesus helps his disciples through this solo fly, flying process in this section where he looks at the equipping them for ministry involves stretching, but also when they're physically alone, they're spiritually supported. We're going to break that down one point at a time. You see, first thing is, is Jesus, he sends them across the, the Sea of Galilee. He says that he sends them to the other side, to Bethsaida. Now, it's interesting because this is, uh, there are several uh, versions that, that go with this story. Now, last week I talked about the, the, pair, uh, the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, a little bit of background because it's relevant this time, but the feeding of the 5,000 is the only story that is found in all four Gospels. And so we see this feeding of the 5,000, and it moves on to Jesus walking on the water, which is recounted in, in three of the, the Gospels. What's interesting is they left this city of Tiberias to go to a desolate place, and that desolate, desolate place was probably on the north uh, end of the Sea of Galilee, right where the Jordan River comes in, so it would be on the east side of the Jordan River, and that was an area that was called Bethsaida. It was technically called Bethsaida Julia, and it was in the, uh, a region which was uh, um, Galantina, which was a Roman province. And then on the west side of the Jordan River, you had the Galilean region. And so they go over to this Bethsaida, and there's a grassy area where they do the feeding of the 5,000. But then in this passage, it says they left Bethsaida to go to Bethsaida. Now, the reason I raise this is there will be some people who say the Bible is full of contradictions, and here's one. How can they go to Bethsaida and leave Bethsaida at the same time? Okay, short answer. I spent a lot of time this week looking at all of this, but two names. One is Bethsaida Julia. The one, other one is Bethsaida Galilee, which is a very small fishing village from which some of the disciples came really close to Capernaum. So what they do is they leave Bethsaida, and they're going across the Sea of Galilee to this other Bethsaida, and, uh, and he puts them out on the boat on themselves. He says that he wants them to go there by themselves. Now, they're going, and the, if you read the other gospel accounts, it'll say Capernaum. Now, why did they say Capernaum instead of Bethsaida? Well, because Capernaum was the larger city that would be known for those who weren't local. You know, there's certain places where you say, well, do you, where do you live? Do you live in Hope Mills? No, we live in Fayetteville. Well, do you live in Hope Mills or Fayetteville? Yes, because for Fayetteville would be what you would use for somebody who was outside. For somebody who's in the region, you would say Hope Mills. So one account says that they're going to Capernaum, which is the major city, but Bethsaida was a fishing village about two miles away, so it's on the same trajectory, but one is referring to 
people in the know, and the other is referring to those that are outside of the area. So there are not, no contradictions here, just in case you come across these things. But Jesus sends them out, and he sends them out by themselves. He doesn't go with them. And why is this? Because the disciples, who are going to be the world changers, who are going to spread this gospel of good news to the ends of the earth, needed to know how to operate as a team without the presence of their team leader. Jesus put them in a boat and put them out on the Sea of Galilee into a situation which was kind of familiar, but now he's not with them. But the thing is, is that while he sends them ahead, he sends them ahead because there's an important task on the other side. Now, they don't know what that task is, but if Jesus sends them ahead, it's because he has a purpose and he has them on a mission and he has them on a task. You know, for us, sometimes we want to know all of the details of the mission, all of the details of the task, when it's not our business. Our job is to get into the boat and to go to the place where Jesus sends us to go. Sometimes we want to have all of the answers before we get into the boat, but we don't see the disciples saying, hey, Jesus, you're not coming with us? Well, what are you going to be doing? Well, why are we going over there? They didn't ask a thousand questions. They listened to the master, they got in the boat, and they started going over to the other side, leaving what they knew, going into what he knows. You know, it's important for us to understand that when we leave the familiar and go into the unfamiliar, it's unfamiliar to us, but it's not unfamiliar to God who is watching out for us and knows what's good for us. So we see the importance of going to the other side, but we also see that while they were physically alone in this journey, they were spiritually supported. You know, they may have felt abandoned as Jesus put them out on the boat, because I just remember a couple of chapters earlier, they had some pretty uh, scary situations as they were uh, on the boat out on the seas. They, they had to wake Jesus up and said, hey, Master, do you not care about us because we're going to drown in this storm? And Jesus calmed the storm as they were going across one time earlier. Now they're getting back into a boat again. This time Jesus isn't in the boat. They had a nice trip across the Sea of Galilee for the feeding of the 5,000, but now he's sending them off by themselves. But you know Jesus didn't abandon them. He sent them on a mission by themselves, but he was going up into the mountains. He went up into the hills to pray and to intercede for them. He went up there to pray and have fellowship with the Father because he needed to be recharged by spending time alone with God, but also he needed to be praying for his disciples. Did you know that Jesus prays for you? In John chapter 17, we have the high priestly prayer where Jesus says he doesn't pray just for his disciples, but he prays for those who believe because of their testimony, and that's you and me. You know, when we feel like we are in the boat by ourselves and the boat is sinking and there are storms that are raging and there's life that's just coming at us so fast, it's important to know that while Jesus isn't physically with us, he is spiritually supporting us. He loves you and he cares about you and he is praying for you and he is watching out for you. So we see that both needs were met in a different way in this scenario. The disciples had a need to grow by flying flying solo. Jesus had a need to be alone with the Father, and so he, they had their time apart, and both needs were met through very different means as they went their, those separate ways. But what ha has happened in your life where you feel strengthened by being stretched and allowing God to work in your life? Sometimes it's not comfortable, but you need to say, look at and evaluate your life and say, what are the things that are stretching me, making me feel uncomfortable? And maybe I should lean into that because God is using that to grow me and to help me to trust him more as I walk with him. Well, we see that growth occurs by flying solo. Well, the second uh, maturity principle is one that even the strongest person is tempted to try and avoid sometimes. And that is that growth occurs by revisiting places of previous failure. <clears throat> you had to go there, didn't you? Growth occurs by going to, uh, to re revisiting places of previous failure. And this can be so hard sometimes. We don't want to deal with our failures in the past. We said, can't we just leave the past behind us? Can't we just ignore it and act like that stage of life didn't happen for me? And, and don't get me wrong, we don't want to live in the past. We don't want to live there, but we have to acknowledge that. And if we haven't gotten victory, we can go to that point of victory to guess what? We can redeem that failure in the past and say, that's not going to hold me down anymore. You see, we have an enemy 
who wants to accuse us. He is called the accuser of the brothers. He wants to put us down and to, to throw all of the junk in our face. And you know something? It happens to me. The enemy accuses me of, of my failures of the past, of my sin, of all of these things, saying, you're not worthy. What are you doing preaching? How can you be a pastor? How can you even call yourself a Christian? He says, you have this issue, you have that issue. But you know something? The enemy's right. I've got issues. I'm a person with issues. But the point is not me as a person with issues, but a Savior who has the overcomer, the Savior who has offered forgiveness, the Savior who is in the process of sanctifying and changing and helping us to grow. So when those accusations from the enemy come, the response is, yeah, you're right. That's all you got? It's under the blood of Jesus. Tell me something that about me that Jesus doesn't know and that isn't covered by his death on the cross for me, then we might have a discussion that would be worrisome. But you know something? He's not going to have a topic that he can accuse me of that is not covered by the blood of Jesus. So when he throws out these accusations, I find it humorous. Yeah, he knows. Jesus knows. I know. I stink at this. I'm no good. But guess what? That's not my identity. I've gone back. I've faced it because I faced it not in my goodness, not in my strength, not in my ability, but in the person of Jesus who is the Savior, the overcomer, and my best friend. It changes everything when we understand that we go back to the previous place of failure. Verses 48 through 52 talk about this. It says, When he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them, and about the fourth, out, uh, fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. But when they saw uh, him walking on the sea, they thought it was a, a ghost and cried out. For they saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now let's unpack this a little bit and we'll look at uh, the, the three main points of this uh, revisiting the place of past failures, the, God's process for us, our, our choice of fear of faith and, and the perspectives and pitfalls along the way. First of all, in verse 48, we see about God's process for us. You know, it's about embracing and sometimes trying to avoid the things that are undesirable. You know, it's interesting because uh, there's an omission in this account of Jesus walking on water. Now, here we have Jesus walking on water, but it doesn't say a single word about Peter getting out to walk on water with him. Now, are you wondering why? Well, Mark was written by John Mark, and it's uh, understood from the historical context that he, was, he, he got the gospel and was writing as a result of the accounts of Peter. So Peter is the one who is the primary source information of John Mark's account of the gospel. Interesting that Peter doesn't talk about the fact that he got out on the water, which would be pretty cool. I'd include that. Hey, I walked on water just like Jesus did. But there was that point of failure where he lost sight of Jesus and he began to sink. Didn't look too good. Now, I'm not saying that Peter was in denial. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not in this account, but it is in the Matthew account. And so Peter is having to, to go back to his, his point of, of, of failure. But it's also interesting to note that that going back to that point of failure can be painful. You see, the, the disciples, as he, they, he sent them out on their own. He said they, they didn't have a huge distance to go, but they were, were rowing. They were struggling against the wind. They were making headway painfully. Literally, it means that they were straining at the oars to row to get from Bethsaida to uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida, Galilee. They were working so hard. Now, this shouldn't have taken a long time, but they were rowing from the evening until the fourth watch. Now, the fourth watch is after 3 a.m. because the, a watch is three hours, and it would be 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12, 12 to, to, to 3. So it was at the fourth watch, so it was after the 3 a.m. They had been working a long time and were not making a whole lot of progress. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes when we try to do something on our own, we're unable to make a whole lot of progress. We can exert a whole lot of effort to accomplish something, and it just doesn't pan out. But we see here, Jesus is praying for them, and now he's starting to walk, 
and then he almost passes them by. I find it very humorous. You know, they're struggling, they're rowing. Jesus sees this, and he sees that they're struggling, and so he gets down and he starts to walk on water. But it says that he was, he meant to pass them by. He was just going to walk on by. Can you imagine? This is not the shallows. This is the Sea of Galilee. It is deep. He is walking on, on, on deep water, and he's just going to walk right on by like they're not even there. If they hadn't have said something, he may have just walked on by. But there's pain. There was a struggle. There was a striving that they were doing in this process of being back in the boat and out on the sea where they were terrified earlier. And they cried out and said, Jesus, save us. Well, now Jesus is not in the boat to save them, and he's actually walking on by. So it was not only physically strenuous because they were rowing against the wind, but it was probably emotionally difficult to take them back to that place where they should have had faith, but they doubted even when Jesus was in the boat. Now Jesus is no longer in the boat. But, you know, it takes time sometimes to make progress. And there's no guarantee of the success when we exert effort. Sometimes we like to make it a formula. If I put forth enough effort, it should produce this result. And we take that in a business sense, which often works out, and we apply it to our spiritual lives and say, well, if I just do enough of these religious activities and I put forth enough effort, then I will arrive at spiritual maturity. But it doesn't work that way. It's not about how much effort we put forth, it's in the question of are we abiding with Jesus and he is the one who uses the events of our life and the process of abiding with him in the event, whether he's with us or whether he sent us ahead in order to experience the growth that he desires for us. This is a process which can take time sometimes. Sometimes it takes more time than we want it to take because we want to be instantly grown up. And there can be surprises along the way. And the surprise for the disciples was that Jesus showed up and walked past them, unless he had said something. Are you willing to face previous places of failure in order not to be defined by your failure? This is a message which is relevant for us today. We have to ask ourselves, am I willing to go to a place where I have failed before in order not to be defined by that? You see, Jesus is the one who can redeem the pain, the hurt, and the failures of our past, but we have to be willing to face them in order to overcome them. And when we face them, we are shining a light in it. And when we shine a spotlight on those things which might embarrass us, which we might not like to deal with, guess what? The enemy can no longer shine light on them because we've already highlighted them. And it, it, he, we basically take away his power to accuse us when we go back and we deal with those things. It can be painful. You know, I think of the, uh, I, I like movies, let's, let's be honest, I'm, I'm going to confess, I like movies. And there's one, y younger folks probably never heard of it, you may be aware of it, but it's called Karate Kid. Anybody heard of Karate Kid? Okay. Now, I love Karate Kid. You know, it's a cheesy movie, but I love daniel Sun with the whole wax on, wax off. And then you have scrub the floor, scrub the floor, and then paint the fence, and paint the fence. And... And, he, and he's having to do all of these things, and he's waxing on, and he's waxing off, and it's painful. And what he's learning through that is there's a process that he goes through, and the pain that he goes through to learn patterns which are going to help him be transformed. Often we have to go through difficulties. We have a retest. We go through the process in order to learn the things that we need to, to learn so that we are equipped for life and the difficulties and challenges that we face. Well, you see, the, God has a process for us, but we also have a choice in that process, a choice of responding with either fear or faith. In verses uh, 49 and 50, it says, The disciples, when they saw him on the sea, they thought he was a ghost and cried out, for they thought they saw him and were terrified. You know, it's interesting because the word that, uh, to describe ghost there in the Greek is uh, phantasma, which is really translated a specter or a uh, a, a, a dark force or a spirit, a demonic spirit. So they see this uh, thing walking across the water. They, they know that people don't walk on water. And so they're thinking it must be some sort of demonic spirit or specter or the word that they used to describe it as a ghost. And so they cried out. It says they literally screamed. I mean, I'm, 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 they, were, they were seriously terrified. Now, when you take fishermen 
who have lived their lives on the Sea of Galilee. They were, ter they were terrified before when the storm was ready to sink the boat in the earlier chapters. But now they weren't screaming then. They said they were waking Jesus up. Now they're screaming. And I can just imagine blood-curdling screams of, Wah! you know, what is going on? But, you know, Jesus, he meets us at those things at the point where the things terrify us and he speaks peace into our lives. There may be things that are going on in your life that just make you want to scream. They terrify you. But Jesus says, don't let, have a case of mistaken identity. Don't have a, the, the disciples, they thought when they saw Jesus that he was a, a ghost. It was a case of mistaken identity. And the thing that was causing this response of terror was really the person who could give them peace and guidance. When they responded to terror, sometimes it might be that we want to respond to a t in a terrifying way to the work that Jesus is doing in our lives because it's uncomfortable, because we don't know what the future holds. But rather than responding with terror, let us recognize that Jesus is the one who prays for us, who cares about us, and wants to speak peace into our circumstance. And he is the one who says, peace be still. Do not be afraid. It is I. Those wonderful words when Jesus said, it is I, I'm here. Don't be afraid. Don't let the things of this world keep you from experiencing the peace that God has. So they take heart, and Jesus uh, arrives, and he speaks peace. Well, what are we're often afraid of is something often that we don't understand or, or is an experience out of the ordinary. You know, what are the areas of your life where the peace of Jesus' presence could help you overcome anxiety. That's the point which is unique to each one of us here in this room. And Jesus wants to speak to that specific point in your life where you're struggling with an anxiety or a fear. Because He is here to overcome your fears. He is here praying for you. And He wants to give you peace. But there's also, in addition to the process that God has for us and the choices that we have of, of fear of failure, there's a perspective that comes in verses 51 and 52 with some side pitfalls as well. In verses 51 and 52 it says, He got into the boat with them, the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. See, the perspective changed when they understood that it was Jesus. He gets into the boat with them, and now... The storm stops, and they experience peace. Now, that's something that they had experienced before, when Jesus was in the boat with them, but is asleep. Now, Jesus, he comes into their situation. He does the miraculous to enter into their situation, walking across water after he's seen them straining and struggling throughout the night. He sees that they're terrified by the unknown, and he gets into the boat with them, and immediate calm takes place. The storm is calmed around them, and the storm in their hearts are calmed as well. Jesus wants to step into the boat that you have right where you are and meet you at your point of need and offer peace in the midst of the storm so that you can grow through knowing that He is with you, that He is available for you. And so when you are on your own and He's not physically present, you know that you're not alone and you don't have to be afraid. This is good news for us today. They faced the reality. The wind ceased. There was the realization that Jesus was an amazing, amazing purpose. They were utterly astounded. But there was also a resistance. In spite of the experience, they still had heart issues that caused comprehension problems. It said that their hearts were hardened, but really that almost means that it was they were resistant. But it's really more of a callousness um, or a dullness. Sometimes in our own lives, in our own spiritual journeys, we can allow things to come in that dull us spiritually, that start to create calluses over our heart. So the work that God wants to do in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds isn't accomplished because of a callousness or a dullness. The way to overcome the callousness or a dullness is to draw near to Jesus and spend time with him. Only through spending time with Jesus, only through abiding with Jesus, will the callousness of our hearts and the dullness of our minds go away so that we can gain the insight to see what God is doing and how He is operating in our lives. Often we lack insight because of the dullness and the callousness. But abiding with Jesus and spending time with Him helps to overcome these things which hinder us. You know, some people say that they have a lot of experience in life. 
maybe on a job, maybe as a Christian, say, I've got 10 years of experience. I've been, I accepted Jesus 30 years ago, so I have 30 years of experience as a Christian. But I've seen some people that they may have been Christians for 30 years, and you may have heard this before, but they don't have 30 years of experience. They have one year of experience repeated 30 times because they haven't learned from the lessons. They haven't learned from the retakes. And so the Lord keeps bringing them back to the point where they need to have a retest, a retake. And that is, oh my, I forgot to silence my phone. And it will, okay. Guess what? This means that I am actually out of preaching time too. Guess what? I'm going to go back to this lesson again and again. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good. But you know, the thing is, is this weekend, is I've been having to go back and deal with lessons myself. I feel like this experience repeated over and over again with the things that frustrate me that shouldn't frustrate me. You know how hard it is to prepare to preach a message on Sunday when the Lord is dealing with your junk on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? It's not fun. But the thing is, is there's a process and the God can help grow us through that. So lean into that process, own it, and you can become more mature through that. So let us not be a person who has one year of experience repeated 30 times. And that leads us to the, the third uh, principle related to maturity, and that's the pace. Is growth occurs by embracing new ministry opportunities. And as I mentioned, I'm just going to touch on this very briefly. Because in verses 53 through 56, it said, And they had crossed over. They came to the land of Gennesaret. And I talked about that earlier. Moored on the shore. And when they had gotten out of the boat, the people immediately recognized them. And they ran about to the whole region and began to bring the sick on their beds wherever they were heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages and cities in the countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Two major points. Previous successes will open doors. Jesus, he had great success in preaching and healing and teaching. And so people recognized and they heard and it opened doors for further ministry. What are you recognized for? Are you recon as, they, as they recognize Jesus, do, will people look at you and recognize you as a little Christ, as a Christian, as a Christ follower? And they let others know. They ran about throughout the whole region letting others know. Are we that urgent to let others know that Jesus is around and are able to meet needs? They brought the needy to Jesus. Are we bringing other people to Jesus so that he can transform them and meet them at their point of need? But not only was there, does the previous success open new doors, the new people matter too. It says that as many as were touched were made well. See, there's a problem. There are many, uh, Jesus went to many different places, to cities, to villages, out in the countryside, at the marketplace, at the Agora. And so the disciples, they'd seen this before. So the miracles were normal to the disciples as they were going with Jesus because it was something familiar to them. It doesn't mean that it was not important for somebody else. You see, there were tons of people who had not seen the miracles of Jesus. They had just heard about it. They needed the encounter with Jesus, even though the disciples had spent time with Jesus a lot. And so we need to recognize that while this encounter with Jesus is old hat for us, it's new and revolutionary information for others. The miracles were new and life-changing to these people in the region of Gennesaret. It's not enough to look to past successes, we need to be involved with people where they are, right here and right now, in the marketplaces around us. You know, are you ordering your life in such a way that those with Je without Jesus can come to know Jesus? See, this is a message not necessarily about walking on water, but this is a message about God providing the lessons, the opportunities to learn lessons that we may have previously missed out on. And he might take us to places that are uncomfortable so that we can learn from those lessons. And he gives us those opportunities. But I want to encourage you today not to run away from those makeup tests, those retests, or even those past failures. But lean into them, grow through them, and be the solution of bringing others to Jesus and proclaiming Jesus to those around us so that they can counter this one who can give peace in the midst of the storms of life. So what are your next steps? 
What are you going to do in light of the fact that Jesus walked on the water and he wants to get into your boat? Will you allow him to change and transform you? And will you allow yourself to be used by him to go ahead to the place where he has you to go for effective ministry? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is relevant for us today. That it's not just a story from long ago, but you want to change lives today. And Lord, if there is someone here who has never put their faith in Jesus, I ask, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. Because we don't want to count on past conversions of people coming to Christ. We want people who don't know Christ to come to Christ today. We don't want to count on past successes in ministry. Lord, we want to lean into the next new thing that you have for us to reach out so that others can come to Christ. And Lord, we want to grow to be mature believers. So use the circumstances and the situations in our lives so that we might learn to, to fly solo but dependent upon you the whole way, knowing that you empower us to do that. Lord, we thank you that you love us and you're committed to us and you're praying for us. And you give us peace in the midst of the terrifying storms of life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.